It's 7.02 p.m. and I'd like to call the uh, 2021 Southeast Texas Region All Clubs meeting to order. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Joe Califf. I'm the president of the Houston Astronomical Society and it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this event tonight. Uh, unfortunately, as all of you are aware, uh, like last year, we're unable to meet together in person and enjoy each other's company uh, there, but at the Houston Museum of Natural Science or wherever we may uh, congregate, uh, but it's always uh, nice to meet with everybody, virtual at least, and uh, to have a wonderful speaker like uh, Dr. Patricia Reif tonight. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it things over to our Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Uh, David Haviland. David, take it away, please. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. I deeply appreciate it. And I deeply appreciate uh, HAS being willing to host, host this event once again. Um, again, Joe, I thank you very much for this really cool introductory slide. I liked it better than the one that I came up with. Uh, the evening's agenda will be fairly straightforward. Uh, call to order in front of your media of choice, which is pretty much what Joe's already done. Going to chat a little bit about the Houston A-Day, the all clubs. We're going to have the introduction of the club uh, club presidents and representatives. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Reif, and we're going to turn it over to her, and we'll have a little question and answer, and that's it. And then beyond that, we hope to see some of you tomorrow at the George for the uh, International Observe the Moon celebration. So again, I want to thank, um, uh, thank the following people who helped out greatly, the Astronomy Day Committee, Joe Califf again for the offer of the use of the HAS Zoom account, and Tracy Nankanas and uh, Kavita Self at the George Observatory for things that they've been doing and trying to get the George uh, up and running. I want to thank members of the A-Day Committee. This has slightly been pared down from last year, but largely this has been a functional committee. Uh, as Joe well knows, it was, as some of you well know, we, we're still trying to hold our, our fingers crossed to hold to have an A day. And we, I think Leonard and I were really game all the way up until July, where we think we could maybe in three months pull one off. But if you recall, July was also near the high point of our friend Delta, and Delta had other plans for, uh, for, for us. And that combined with HMNS current uh, policies and restrictions about uh, COVID and large gathering, we once again elected to put uh, A-Day as we know it off. So we have our hopes set for 2022. But nonetheless, throughout the year since last year, we deeply appreciate the input from the committee. And again, Mark Holsworth for hosting the, hosting the Astronomy Day uh, website. Astronomy Day at the George Observatory, as we know, is held there uh, down south, the Brazos Penn State Park, the observatory. This, uh, uh, if I get it right, no, I can't do it. I'm in, I'm in I have to keep reminding myself, I'm in um, Acrobat, not PowerPoint, so I can't highlight my mouse. The deck area there in front of the uh, uh, research dome would be full of scope, full of scope deck scopes, and we'd have anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people coming through. East dome has the 18-inch refractor, the uh, I'm sorry, reflector. The research dome has a 36-inch uh, beast, and the west dome has a 14-inch SCT. And previous slides from A Day. This is kind of like what we what we're missing and wanting to do. I have a clubs table. I have a, a, a outdoor talks, uh, deck scopes, uh, interaction with the crowd. So the interaction with the public. So we can try to educate them on, as far as light pollution and things they need to know about astronomy. And uh, again. Things going on in the deck, face painting, and I always loved the uh, Lunar Planetary Institute when they did the moon phases with the uh, palette of Oreo cookies that they'd bring, and then some of the night pictures that were taken. I believe some of these are by Sarah or uh, or uh, Chris Randall. Houston Astronomy Day past attendance. We're all the way up here. 2021 swapped with the International Observe the Moon, and we're probably going to have three shifts tomorrow at 75 uh, people a shift. That's the best we can do. And all we can do is hope in 2022 that we can run some level of, of an A-Day. Mm -hmm. um, Insperity Observatory, Aaron will definitely talk about this. This is a, 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 a jewel up north in the humble, humble area. He's got incredible hardware up there. If you have not yet gone up to take a look at the observatory, you're missing out and please do yourself a favor to do exactly that. 
Aaron kindly helped in 2019 host uh, Astronomy Day when we were not able to host it at the George. And he has made efforts to uh, have a spring Astronomy Day. And maybe this year, maybe 2022, <laughs> uh, fingers crossed. And oh, weather, yeah, weather oh, gods, oh. we might be able to have something. All depends on COVID. Uh, I would like to make one correction to your slide. It's a 16-inch sure. Mead SCT. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll fix that. <laughs> um, at A Day 2019, we had very much the same thing. We had deck scopes, as you can see, down in the lower right. We had activities in the upper right going on, T-shirt sales, and things like that. So it was. A, it's a really, really good place that's well suited to uh, an astronomy day. Astronomy day event. All right, introduction of the Southeast Texas Astronomy Club presidents. I'm gonna hand this over to Leonard. All right, thanks, David. Uh, and uh, again, welcome everyone to the, uh, to the 2021 meeting. Uh, so we'll introduce the clubs and uh, we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So give you a little, little warning there. Uh, when we call up uh, your organization, if your representative would go off mute and then just take a minute or two, tell us a little bit about your organization. And uh, also, uh, if there's any news or updates, that'd be appropriate time to uh, to do that. So so first up is going to be the Astronomical Society of Southeast Texas, or ASSET. And Will Young is the current president. Will couldn't be here tonight, so I'll just tell you a little bit about that. Uh, ASSET meets on the second Friday of the month, and they were formed back in 1989. They've got a membership of 30 to 40 people, and they do a lot of outreach work and work with the uh, Murray J. Frank Planetarium, as was part of the Beaumont ISD. So, and they have uh, several volunteers helping out with organization of the Texas Star Party and El Dorado Star Party. So welcome, Asset. Uh, next is going to be Community of Humble and Sparity Observatory Society and Dr. Aaron Clevinson. Hey, awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are a virtual club. We don't actually have meetings, but we do get together on the first Friday of every month to do observing at the observatory. That is our public night. And uh, at the current time, reservations are required because of COVID, uh, but we do have one coming up and we're very excited about it. We've been closed for a couple months because of COVID. Um, number of members, it's larger than the number shown on this slide, but I don't know the current number. Uh, so I can't share that. I do want to jump in here. I know this is off script, but I do want to jump in here to say one thing. Um, the Astronomical League is offering an Observe the Moon Night opportunity working with NASA. And we want to invite all of you to participate in that. Uh, if you want more information, you can contact me. You can check the Astronomical League website. And there's just all kinds of ways to find out. You can check the NASA website and find out what's going on. But they have uh, general purpose downloadable certificates for anybody who observes the moon. And we also have an observing challenge with the Astronomical League um, that I want to invite people to participate in as well. It's a very easy challenge. And that's the bit about it for me. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Next up, Fort Bend Astronomy Club, Tony Wheezy. Our club meets on the third Friday of every month. Uh, since COVID, we've been doing uh, online stuff. Uh, we range from beginners all the way to extremely experienced observers. And our club is known for its tremendous outreach activities. And we can't wait for COVID to get over so we can get back to what we really enjoy doing a lot of. Uh, everybody's welcome and we're a great group of folks. Awesome, thank you, Tony. Next up, Houston Astronomical Society, Joe Califf. Thanks so much, Leonard. Uh, yes, as I mentioned before, I'm the president of the Houston Astronomical Society. We're one of the oldest astronomical societies or astronomy clubs in Texas. We were founded in 1955. Uh, last year, we uh, peaked at over 870 members and we're getting close to that again. We meet on the first Friday of the month, typically, unless there's a holiday that preempts that. Um, and I always say uh, those 870 members are the greatest asset that we have. We run the gamut from very uh, beginner novices all the way up to uh, folks who've made some significant astron uh, astronomical discoveries. Um, our second best asset after our members is our 18 acre dark site near Columbus. So this is an area where we can safely congregate and uh, be able to enjoy this activity together. Uh, we have a large loaner telescope program. At last count, we had over 40 telescopes that members can borrow 
And uh, prior to COVID, we had a very active outreach group, and we're hoping to get back to that again. So I uh, really appreciate everybody joining us. And if you have any questions, the website is there at the bottom. Thanks, Joe. Huntsville Amateur Astronomy Society, Mike Prokosh. Uh, hi guys. Wow. Yeah, you guys are, are smooth with these transitions on these Zoom meetings. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, our Huntsville Amateur Astronomy Society, we uh, currently have not had beings in a very long time. Not a whole lot of us up here. We're a pretty small group. Uh, the, the main thing I, I was kind of hoping to share with you guys, is I have pretty big news as far as the Sam Houston Observatory goes. Um, we are, long story short, probably in the near future, going to be changing the name of it to the Domini Astronomy Park. We have been very fortunate. I've been working on this for a, a number of years, and uh, what we're headed towards uh, is basically, if you've ever been up here, everything except for the main classroom building is either going to be taken down and, and rebuilt or added to. So. The, the main centerpiece is hopefully going to be a 18 and a half foot ash dome uh, with a um, telescope on the inside that will be wheelchair accessible. Um, we are not fully funded, but we've got the big portion of it is, is, is there. We actually, the architect was out a couple days ago to uh, look over the site and uh, I have a long list of questions that they have sent my way to um, kind of go over things that I had not considered. So anyway, hopefully in the near in the near future, um, um, I've been told that groundbreaking or some ribbon cutting ceremony uh, timeline maybe about a year. So maybe this time next year will be um, at least that part of it will be open. But those dreadful sheds with those. Uh, tracks that, that, that you chirp over and they're going to be gone. Um, any case, um, that's what we have headed our way pretty soon. And um, hopefully I'll have more to share as uh, uh, things get closer. Okay, great, Mike. That's uh, exciting to hear. Okay, uh, Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. Uh, Doug Holland, is Doug Holland on? Or do we have a representative from JSCIS that would like to jump in? Okay, we'll just leave their slide up there for a minute. I'll jump in um, as the past president. Uh, we meet on the second Friday at 7.30, normally at the Lunar Planetary Institute at 3600 Bay Area Boulevard, but we've also been having uh, virtual meetings. Uh, we've been doing that through StreamYard and then porting it directly to the club's YouTube channel. We've got outreach parties, outreach events at the Hack Winery, Lunar Planetary Institute, and others in the Clear Lake area, and we're gearing up for the transition right between October and November for the, for the club to make its uh, fall trip to Fort McCavitt out near um, San Angelo. And then we'll, some of them will also be taking in um, uh, the El Dorado Star Party and try to daisy chain that with the uh, trip to Fort McCavitt and get a week of imaging out of it. We are developing an uh, astro imaging special interest group using, um, uh, I believe it's, uh, oh, it just fell out of my head, um, Arduino and, um, oh, the other one. Leonard, you can help me out. <laughs> oh, Raspberry uh, Pi. Very high. Raspberry yeah, Pi. that's what I was looking for. Yeah, and try to automate, automate your your telescope observation and uh, uh, ast astrophotography. I'll let it go there. All right. Thanks, David. Okay, the last club list is North Houston Astronomy Club. Uh, Bruce Pollard is the current president. Um, Aaron Clevinson, I believe you're going to stand right. in for Bruce this evening. So I'm not Bruce, uh, and you've already heard from me once, but I'm the Astronomical League Coordinator for the Northeastern Astronomy Club, past president. Um, we do meet on the fourth Friday, and our meetings, too, due to COVID, have been virtual meetings. Uh, so we do have them coming up, and we hope to see some of you at our meetings. 
uh, we would normally be meeting at Lone Star College in Kingwood. Uh, currently, what else do I want to say? We do have a dark site. It's up in Montgomery, so it's one of the northern sites. And uh, right now, I'd say we've got probably close to 150 members all total. Uh, family units, about 100. And uh, we, too, have a SIG. Ours is actually a telescope, amateur telescope making SIG. And what we discovered was nobody wanted to grind their own mirrors. In fact, nobody wanted to even silver their own mirrors. They said, let's just start with the pieces and we'll do the assembly and all that. So we're right now in the process of uh, making seven different Dobsonian telescopes. Uh, five of them are eight inch, very similar. One of them is a 13 inch that actually belongs to the Northeastern Astronomy Club already. It just needed to be rebuilt. And uh, I'm working on an innovative off-axis secondary mirror 12 and a half inch telescope. And uh, that is the mirror that we actually got from, um, come on, Aaron. This is the Johnson Space Center Astronomical yeah. Society. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's what I thought it was. I was gonna say, oh my. Anyway, so that's our plan for it. And uh, we're excited about that. So more on that perhaps next year. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's it's it, the, thank you. It's the old Krauss mirror. We were happy to donate that to you. And, uh, yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, last on the list, the George Observatory. And uh, Tracy Knauss is the director of the observatory. Kavita Self is the uh, director of H Man at Sugarland. I don't see either one of them on this evening. Uh, I think David kind of covered uh, when some of his slides covered, but basically, the George is our home observatory for Astronomy Day. So uh, we hope to. Um, Hope to be uh, back out there next year. Uh, the George was open back in uh, 1989, so we just made 30 year anniversary. They've gone through a, a really nice renovation, so uh, we'll uh, get out there as soon as you can and uh, and take a look at the new George. So uh, I think David, if you have anything to add, otherwise I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Good. I think Hannah Lang just got a permanent job there too. So we're excited about her joining this real, she's been volunteering. So it's nice to have her on the staff. All right. Well, first, it's an honor and pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. As our local uh, uh, astronomy icon, Dr. Pat, uh, Rife is well known to the Houston astronomy area and clubs. She received her bachelor's degrees in physics from Oklahoma State University in 1971, came to Rice University, obtained her master's in space science in 1974, and PhD in space physics and astronomy in 75, uh, where she analyzed uh, data from the Apollo 14's ALSEP instrument. I'm going to stop in my introduction and ask, is that, that's off the website. Is that right, Pat? You've got you did your master's and then you got your PhD in one year? Um, yeah, you're yeah not... well, to get your master's, you have to get all of your coursework out of the way first. So okay. um, often often it doesn't take quite, it, it takes longer for the master's than the, than the PhD because oh, okay. you finished coursework. Okay, mine my, my was in biology and the PhD took me a lot longer than it did to get the, PhD, the master's. Okay, back to the, back to the no, no more squirrel moments, back to the topic. As we know, Dr. Reif is a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and was the founding director of the Rice Space Institute there at Rice University. Her research focuses on space plasma physics, mostly in the area of magnetos magnetospheric physics, or what's colloquially called space. Dr. Reif has over 150 pewed publications, so she's, she's no lightweight by any means. We have a heavy hitter here, folks, <laughs> and has served as the editor or associate editor for a number of journals. She has served on advisory committees for the National Science Foundation, NASA, the National Academy of Sciences, and the Association of American Universities and Goddard Flights, uh, Space Flight Center, to name a few. It would take more time than I have to summarize her relentless commitment to outreach and education, but it, it is unparalleled. But to be brief, Pat developed what is called an off-ramp for the information highway, creating something called the Creating the Public Connection. This brings real-time Earth and space science data to museums and schools, originally sponsored by NASA's Digital Library Technology Program. 
Over 10 million people interacted with her exhibits and planetarium shows at the Houston Museum of Natural Science, among other museums, and another 5 million with her websites. Over 300,000 of her educational CD and DVD roams and planetarium videos have been distributed through her spinoff company called spaceupdate.com. She's been a leader in public education activities, including being the director for four years for a teacher education project sponsored by the National Science Foundation and the Eisenhausen Foundation in collaboration with Dr. Carolyn Sumners at the HMNS. The latest collaboration is the creation of marketing of the Discovery Dome, one of which happens to be at the George Observatory. This portable digital theater is there to teach earth and space science at over, at over 350 installations in 38 countries and 35 states through a distribution uh, a company called ePlanetarium. She works with the American Astronomical Society in the planning for the 2023 and 2024 eclipses, which is germane to tonight's topic. And with the new website at texaseclipse.net, you can find more information. She has taught thousands online and in person how to safely view the solar eclipse and in 2017 gave away more than 35,000 eclipse glasses uh, teachers, uh, to the teachers and the public. As best we can in this crazy virtual world, if you can unmute your mics for a little bit, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Pat Reif. Uh, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, well, let me <clears throat> then uh, share my screen and uh, start the show. And While that's coming up, I apologize for interrupting. If anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask of Dr. Reif uh, at the end of the presentation, please use the chat function in Zoom and get your questions uh, asked there. We'll cue those and then uh, Dr. Reif, if you don't mind, uh, we can ask you a few of those at the end of the presentation. Absolutely, but if it's Wonderful. anything that needs to be uh, interrupted, I don't mind being interrupted. <laughs> squirrels, squirrels. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I wanted to, uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. So I'm 95% I'm of this is stuff you probably know. Uh, but this, this, this is the presentation that I do uh, now. I'm going to get ready to do to all of the Texas teachers at the cast meeting in about three weeks. And so you're getting my preliminary. We're also going to have for the teachers some hands on things so they can go out and look, uh, look at the sun. But the idea is we want to get everyone in Texas uh, to see the eclipses that are coming on because this is this is uniquely Texas experience. Uh, so I'm calling it the Texas Nexus. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, if you look now at the map of where the annular eclipse is going to be, uh, just about exactly two years from yesterday, uh, <laughs> there will be an annular eclipse crossing the United States from west to east, uh, and it will go just west of San Antonio. Uh, across from Midland, you know, to Corpus. Uh, so this gray area is the zone of annularity, and this outer uh, limit is 85% solar coverage. Uh, six months later, we're going to have a total solar eclipse that crosses uh, North America from Mazatlan, again through Texas and off, off through uh, New England. Uh, and again, the, the zone of totality is the dark gray, which includes Waco and Dallas and Northwest Austin, Northwest San Antonio, <clears throat> literally millions of people. And this outer boundary is the zone of 90% coverage. Uh, so it turns out that everyone in the state of Texas will have at least 85% coverage of the sun for one or both of these events. I think this guy gets down to 84, but you know, essentially the entire state. Um, and, and especially since annulars are never safe to view without uh, solar filters, it's, it's really critical for us to, uh, to make the effort to teach people on how to observe safely. <clears throat> so as, as he mentioned, I have a website called Texas Eclipse. Uh, net, 
uh, we've identified all the parks, all the schools, all the <laughs> zoos that are in or near the, the zones of annularity or, or, um, or uh, um, totality, and also all 30 of teacher resource centers we want to be able to go to and make a presentation. Um, so this is kind of solar lunar eclipse 101. And as I say, most of you guys, this old hat for most of y'all, but I do just kind of want to go through some of it. We've been creating with NASA resources, some animations uh, that can be downloaded for free. Uh, these can be shown either flat screen, like I'm going to show them to you, or we have them in full dome. So you can put them on a, a planetarium dome, either a mirror type uh, dome or a, or a fisheye dome. So <clears throat> who, who can see it? Well, as I mentioned, there's uh, almost everybody in Texas will see part of a, a, a significant eclipse coming up. Uh, there's also a lunar eclipse coming up in, in just a few weeks. Um, and it's technically partial, but it's virtually total. I mean, it's the, the moon will be 99% inside the umbra. And then two weeks later, uh, we'll have a, a total solar eclipse. Now, this one won't be visible from North America. It will be visible from uh, Antarctica. And I'm going to be on a ship with Paul Maley, and many of you know <laughs> Paul. And, and, a, and a number of people are going to be heading out uh, to, uh, we'll fly into Usharia and get on a cruise ship and, and hopefully see the eclipse from, uh, uh, from Antarctica. Uh, and then, of course, the annular eclipses in 2023 and total in 2024. So here's what the partial lunar eclipse is going to look like in a few weeks. Uh, and here's this little tiny bit uh, of the moon that's not going to be covered. Uh, so it's going to be pretty nice. The, the, there'll be a really nice gradient of clear across the moon going from very bright at this limb to being relatively dark in the middle. Uh, so it'll be nice to see. It's, for us, it's well placed. Uh, you subtract, you know, six hours. Uh, so the beginning of the penumbral starts about one. Uh, the beginning of the partial starts about, uh, excuse me, midnight. Uh, beginning of the partial starts at 118 and, and goes till um, uh, four o'clock, <laughs> 440. But uh, the maximum is uh is about halfway in between so uh we're we'll be able to see the entire uh, eclipse from where we are uh, here's kind of the map of where the eclipse is visible and so uh, we'll be able to see all of the eclipse whereas other parts in the earth won't see any or they'll see an eclipse at moonset or they'll see eclipse at moonrise but but we're fortunate to be in the in the lucky hemisphere for this uh, event now the, the the solar eclipse in, in December is is one that's really interesting to me because uh, normally uh, you get uh, you know eclipses paths go from west to east. Well, this one's going to kind of circling the pole, which is a little crazy. Uh, and and furthermore, the interesting thing about it is we're going to see it at about three twenty uh, a.m. local time. Uh, which is a little crazy until you realize, yeah, that's December, so that's summer, so that's midnight sun. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, this will be my 18th time on the center line, uh, but my first midnight sun eclipse. So I've been I've been able to uh, to see to see eclipses and at dawn and at dusk and at noon, but I've never seen one at 3 a.m. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope we don't get clouded up. Uh, but of course, the ones that are real most excited about and the ones where we, as an astronomy community, really need to get our act together and get people uh, to, to observe safely uh, is this uh, these two upcoming Texas eclipses. So the first one is October uh, 2023, as I mentioned. It's going to go straight across almost <clears throat> from northwest to, to southeast. Um, and uh, it'll also pick up a little of, of uh, Central America as well. <clears throat> and for us, it's going to be 
you know, uh, around uh, 10, uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, we, we will still be on daylight saving. So it'll be a five hours difference instead of, instead of six. Um, so the, the totality will be then and, uh, uh, well, the, the annularity. <clears throat> and then the total solar eclipse uh, on April 8th. And again, this will be during daylight savings. And so it will cross uh, uh, Texas. But the best weather, as I'll show you in a minute, is actually in Mexico and Southern Texas. So I suspect we're going to get a tremendous influx of, of people. So here's the uh, map from the Great American Eclipse website. In fact, they also have a Texas map that you can order uh, that shows both of them, uh, both of them. But if you want to download mine, you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> so uh, and so here are kind of some of the, the timings as they go uh, through through Texas. So it's, you know, morning to early afternoon for the October and uh, early afternoon. Uh, for the uh, for the total, so it'll be uh, easy to get there. Uh, you can you know stay in a hotel outside of the zone of totality and drive a half an hour and find yourself a spot. Um, uh, there's tons of state parks in the uh, in the field of view. There's tons of of RV parks. There's uh, lots of space, <laughs> and that's what makes Texas so great. So one of the things we like to do when we do a presentation like this is talk about, you know, the difference between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse. And uh, I, I used to have a t-shirt that I, I got to redo it. It had, you know, sun, earth, and moon, lunar eclipse, sun, moon, and earth, solar eclipse, moon, sun, earth, apocalypse. <laughs> Well, hopefully we're not going to have an apocalypse, but <clears throat> so we've developed these animations with with NASA resources and I'll show you I'll show you some of ours and you can, uh, as I said, uh, you can point people to the YouTube versions or if you want to download them, let me know and I can uh, I can get them for you. <clears throat> so a solar eclipse is when the moon casts its shadow on the Earth. A lunar eclipse is when the Earth casts its shadow on the moon. And to totality means that the entire sun will be blocked out by the moon, uh, which allows us to see the corona. And, and as a space physicist, uh, corona is the key to uh, the expansion of solar wind out into the uh, into the atmosphere. And that's the research that I personally do is to study uh, the solar wind and its effects on the Earth's uh, environment. Okay. All right. So again, these are some diagrams that we've done. We've got, we've had previously some white background diagrams, but we've now updated them. So again, any of these diagrams are welcome to steal from our website. It's called space.rice.edu/eclipse. So you can get to all of the diagrams and all of the animations uh, that I showed you through here. So. I mean, you can't do this to scale because otherwise every, <laughs> everything would be really teeny and really far. <laughs> so you have to cheat a little bit, we, but we're trying not to cheat too much. Uh, the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, but it's 400 times farther away. And so uh, on average, the moon doesn't quite cover the sun, but when it's close closer to the earth, it does. When it's farther from the earth, it doesn't. So a, a total solar eclipse uh, can block out exactly uh, the entire disk of the sun and only a relatively small area is in the shadow of the moon. And that's called the umbra. Anybody in the umbra sees a total eclipse and anybody in the penumbra sees a partial eclipse. And of course, in the partial eclipse, you have to use uh, uh, solar filters, but for totality, uh, you can take off your filters and that's really the payoff for all this planning and traveling. 
Uh, on the other hand, a, a lunar eclipse happens when the moon gets into the Earth's shadow. Uh, and because uh, the Earth's atmosphere scatters blue light, what's left and refracts to reach the moon is just uh, the red light. And so that's why the moon uh, looks red uh, during a, uh, a lunar eclipse. And now in an annular eclipse, which is what we're gonna have in 2023, the, the moon is a little too far from the sun. And so its angular size is a little bit too small. So even if you have them perfectly aligned, you have a smaller uh, apparent moon uh, that's not quite covering up the entire sun and you get a ring of light, which is called an annulus, okay? So anybody in this ant umbra will see the annular eclipse where the, uh, the ring of the sun will be left behind. Uh, you still have partials uh, before and after, but because you still have part of the sun's photosphere sh showing, you cannot, uh, uh, take off your uh, solar filters at any time. Uh, this was an image that I did from, uh, from an annular eclipse that was in uh, Sandia Peak. And it was getting close to sunset. So this was an, actually an unfiltered picture, but you can still see the, 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 the sun was still too bright <laughs> uh, to look at it, even through the app at, uh, at near sunset. Here's a one with a slight filter, not quite strong enough filter. So you can see the annulus was left behind. <clears throat> so this is a, a little movie that we created on uh, the solar versus lunar eclipse when geometry. Exactly this is best in, the in sun, a planetarium dome where this is Earth. now surrounding you. The deepest part of the shadow is called the umbra. People in the umbra see a total solar eclipse. It takes about an hour for the shadow to cross the Earth. Two weeks later, the full moon can cross into Earth's umbra. Since the Earth is four times the diameter of the moon, the umbra is also four times larger or 16 times the area. So lunar eclipses are more common than solar eclipses. Everyone on the night side of Earth can see a total lunar eclipse, but only people in the narrow of totality can see a total solar eclipse. So not only are lunar eclipses more common, more people can observe each one. So uh, when the new moon passes exactly in front of the sun, its shadow crosses the earth. The deepest part of the shadow is called the umbra. Oh, sorry, we didn't do that People again. in the umbra. Um, so now this is an, our annular eclipse animation. I haven't put the audio on this yet, but now the, the moon is just a little bit too far away. And so the main part of the umbra doesn't quite reach the earth. Um, but it still will cause a, a, a darkening that's, that's visible as the shadow passes uh, across the earth. And then as we swing around, then we go back and can see. And again, this is really effective in a dome. <laughs> You're kind of rotating the whole field of view in a dome. Uh, and so you see the, the um, moon crossing in front of the sun. Now this is a close up of what you might see in an annular eclipse if you had uh, one of those circular solar filters that you hold up against the sky, you'll see the sunspots, you'll see the moon crossing. Uh, one of the things you'll see is beautiful rainbows on either side of it. You'll see clouds crossing because you know, you're guaranteed there's gonna be a cloud. <laughs> uh, but this is kind of a close, close up of what, what uh, we're expecting to see. We're going to be closer to uh, solar maximum, so we will be seeing a fair amount of sunspots, we hope, for, for this event. And I have another one that's very similar, except it's a completely back background, if you want. Now, this is a, 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 first an animation of the phases this of the, the disc eclipse. of the moon first starts to cover the sun. During the partial phases, you must use solar filters or projection techniques 
to safely observe the sun. It takes about an hour for the moon to completely cover the sun. The last bit of the sun is the diamond ring. Second contact, totality. Third contact, put back on your filters. The last hour, the moon gracefully exits, uncovering the sun. As the last bit of the moon leaves the sun, it is fourth contact and the end of the eclipse. Um, with the, when you see a total eclipse, uh, the moon blocks off the main bright part of the sun, the photosphere, and what's left is the uh, corona, this wispy part here, uh, but also a lot of very red arches. Those are called prominences. About 90% of the people say, oh, there's a flare. No, it's not a flare. It's a prominence. <laughs> now, flares often come from prominences. That, that one end or the other of a prominence might have an explosion which lets that prominence go, and that's called a coronal mass ejection. But what's really cool about the corona is you can really see the magnetic fields. I mean, we think of magnetic fields as being invisible, uh, but these are one of the few times when you can really see the magnetic fields of the sun. And what you see is near the sun's equator, these, magic, these magnetic fields are closed loops and the solar wind is hotter and it gets out a little more slowly, whereas near the sun's poles, uh, the magnetic fields are radial. And so the corona escapes easier and it's, and, it's, and it's cooler and flows faster. But you, a photo like this, you cannot take with a regular camera. You can see this with your eyes because your eyes are really good at, at discriminating things that are at different brightness levels. But if you want to take a photograph of an of a, of a eclipse, you have to take a series of images with short exposure going to long exposure in order to get back that, that, uh, that detailed picture. As the moon covers the last bit of the sun, the sky around you gets dark. It's still not safe to remove your solar filters though. The last piece of the sun makes a diamond ring. Bailey's beads appear, small bits of the sun peeking through valleys on the edge of the moon. Now it's safe. Um, so now this is what you might see if you were sitting on the moon uh, during a solar eclipse on Earth. This sequence shows how a solar eclipse might appear from the lunar surface. Night is falling on the moon. The distant mountains are still in sunlight. After sunset, the lunar surface is blue, lit by Earth shine. It's new moon at Earth but it's full Earth at the moon. Since the moon's shadow covers only a small part of Earth, the lunar surface doesn't get a lot darker. And this is an actual photo. The others were animations, reconstructions by Don Davis, who's a very amazing space artist. Uh, and he uses, <laughs> uh, numerical reconstructions, but also photographs to get the best uh, possible. This is one that's an actual photograph. <clears throat> now, this is what um, you would see uh, if you this were shows in the- how at, the moon's shadow orbit. might appear from a spacecraft in Earth orbit. This sequence is based on actual previous space-based photography. The moon's shadow isn't just a sharp dark spot, but has shading as the penumbra darkens to the umbra at the center. Since the spacecraft is in the penumbra, the sun is only partially covered by the moon. So we're trying to give different fields of view, especially that would look good inside a dome, of course. <clears throat> Now, we were really lucky. We had like four uh, lunar eclipses in a row. 
Uh, and in fact, I think a lot of the people thought that was meant we were going to go through the end of the earth, but you know, we didn't. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it was uh, just as I said that you got a definite grad gradation of the color of the of the of the moon. It's always brightest near the edge of the umber where more light can scatter in and darkest uh, near the center. So now if you look what those photographs look like, this is what I'm saying. When you're really close to the edge of the umbra, it's bright. And the one we're getting ready to have in, in uh, November will look something like this. That'll be a little bit of sunlight right at the edge and then it will uh, be darker across it. Uh, <clears throat> now, one thing that's really cool uh, uh, that I really didn't even understand until a few years ago uh, was a thing called a selenelian. A uh, selenelian is when you have an eclipse, right, a, a lunar eclipse, right at dawn or at dusk. And because of refraction, you can actually see both the sun and the moon at the same time, especially if you're on top of a high building. So like here is the eclipsed moon coming out of eclipse and the, the red sky from dawn behind us. <laughs> uh, we, we had a similar one uh, at the uh, eclipse. So uh, last lunar eclipse we did uh, with, uh, with Carolyn, we did a live, live program there. And what's cool about the selenelian is you are standing right at the terminator so you look at the sun and the sun appears red to you because the blue light is scattered out. So you look back at the sun, the sun looks red because the blue light's been scattered out. And then you turn around and you look at the moon and it looks red because it's that same red light that's passing over your head is what's lighting the moon. And that's, that's actually kind of cool. That red light is making that moon red. And uh, so you get that at a, at a selenelian where you wouldn't uh, in a, other kinds of, of lunar eclipses. So here's now an animation of a lunar eclipse as seen from Earth. A lunar Earth. eclipse as seen from Earth is leisurely, taking three hours or more. When the moon enters the umbra, a dark bite out appears and grows, the partial phase. When the moon is entirely inside the umbra, totality begins and can last for an hour or more. The moon appears red because the only light reaching it is refracted through Earth's atmosphere. One side might be brighter than the other because it is closer to the edge of the umbra. When part of the moon emerges from the umbra, totality is over. When all of the moon emerges, it's the end of the eclipse. All right, now <clears throat> this is kind of fun because this is what you might see if you were on the moon and it was a lunar eclipse as seen from Earth, but for you on the moon, it was, it's actually a solar eclipse for you. In a lunar eclipse, the moon travels through the Earth's shadow. If you were on the moon, it would be a total solar eclipse for you but the earth appears four times as big as the sun. The land around you gets dark. When you are completely in earth's shadow, the land around you is red. The only light that reaches you is red light bent by earth's atmosphere. So as far as I know, this has never been photographed, but you should be able to, from the moon to see a red ring of the earth's atmosphere as seen by the moon. Some people show it as being a beautiful eclipse. It won't be a beautiful eclipse because the sun is going to be really small, <laughs> but it is going to be interesting. All right, so where do you want to go? Well, you, if, you abs if you can go to totality, you know, 99% is not good enough. Uh, but uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you can't find a hotel in totality, you know, get a hotel nearby and drive in. But, be plan for traffic. The traffic in, uh, in you know, going to the 2017 eclipse was crazy. 
So we we all got in two days before and camped out and we, we had our spot and we stayed there and we stayed and over an extra night so we didn't have any traffic. But of course, you may not be able to do that. Now, the problem, of course, with the April event, it is a Monday and a school day, but we're going to try to see if we can talk the schools in calling it a field trip day and trying to get the schools in buses uh, to go to the zones of totality because there are tremendous numbers of stadiums that are actually in the zone of totality, including, you know, the Cotton Bowl and, the, you know, the baseball stadiums in Dallas and and in San Antonio, uh, the, the uh, uh, a lot of, of amusement parks, including Six Flags San Antonio and Six Flags Arlington are in the path of totality. Uh, so we're hoping there's going to be, you know, a lot of, and this is what I'm working with, with the AAS is to try to uh, get the, get as much coordination as possible. So that when these, these people, these, these, venues that can handle lots of people, we wanna make sure they do. Uh, and it would be fun to have a, a, um, a an exhibition baseball game between the, the Astros and the, and, uh, and the Rangers in Dallas. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, stop, uh, stop the game for totality and then go back. <clears throat> this is really, the key though, when you're trying to find where you want to go for the eclipse, and that is what is the cloud cover? And I've been really lucky. I've been to uh, 15 totalities and only two of them were clouded out and one of them was pouring down rain, <laughs> but that was the only one that was really, really crazy. I mean, the other ones, some of them were pretty iffy, but the, the, the clouds do have a tendency to disperse a bit uh, when the totality comes in, even the thin clouds become more transparent when the sun is skinnier. Because when the sun is full, a thin cloud has a lot of multiple scatterings, and so it looks opaque. But once the sun goes skinny uh, and doesn't have as much light uh, scattering off those clouds, they actually you can see through them. And the first time that happened to me in Mazalan, I thought it was the hand of God. And then when it happened three more times, I thought, oh, well, maybe there's something to this. <laughs> but never hurts to praise God for good weather. Anyway, this is the, this is the calculated uh, cloud cover. And guess what? The best uh, chance of low clouds is going to be in Mexico, uh, Mazalan on the on the beach and then crossing Mexico. Here's the Texas-Mexican border. It's still quite good through most of Texas. Uh, and then it gets worse across the rest of the country. So that's why I'm saying we're, we're gonna see a bunch of, of tourists coming and we need to be prepared for them. Uh, another thing, if you've never been to Xavier Yobet's uh, um, a website, he has a clickable uh, map and you can click any location and it will give you the start time and stop time of, of the partials and, the, uh, and uh, the maximum obscuration. So in Houston, it'll be 94% and people I'm sure are gonna say, well, not, 94 is plenty, but <laughs> you and I know 94 is not good enough. There's just, something about totality that is so different that you've got to go. So why do I need to go to totality? Well, it really is a multi-sensory experience. It's not just your eyes, it's your skin, the temperature falls, the wind picks up, um, the shadows get really sharp because we're used to having the sun being a half a degree apart, so all shadows are, are a little fuzzy, uh, but the shadows start getting sharp. And, and the other thing that seems weird to me as totality approaches, the sky looks kind of gray. Normally when the sun is setting, it things look red. So your eyes kind of, kind of uh, counteract that. So when, when now you're going into totality, 
your eyes are expecting it to be red, but it's not. So everything is a little blue to you, which is weird. Um, the clouds, as I mentioned, become uh, transparent. And, and each one really is different. Uh, another thing that makes makes it so amazing, if, if you've got a, a, a totality that's near noon and you get a nice uh, Western horizon, you can often see that, that towering uh, shadow coming at you and washing over you. It is uh, really amazing. When I was in Libya, I told everybody, you know, don't try to take pictures on the way in. Take your pictures on the way out. Just experience this part. And, and when you see that thing rushing at you at a thousand miles an hour, when it hits you, when that shadow engulfs you and you look up, then you're in totality. So there's no question you're in totality because you, you saw the shadow come at you, which is really amazing. And I mean, it'll make the hair <laughs> stand up on your arms. <laughs> so here are some, some pictures from some events that I've been to. Here's that, that, that um, Corona, um, um, uh, effect that I was telling you about the halo um, rainbow around the sun uh, when it gets really narrow. Uh, here's some nice prominences and a diamond ring. Uh, here's some more really pretty diamond rings from a couple of different uh, ones I've been to. Now we can create our own uh, eclipses from the ground using our space-based solar telescopes. Uh, but it's still not, not the same thing. But one of the cool things we can see are, are these big outbursts from the sun called coronal mass ejections. And these are the things that really, when they hit the earth, cause uh, space weather. Well, it turns out these were observed and sketched during an eclipse of 1860. So the, the first <laughs> real, real, uh, observation or at least sketch of an observation of a coronal mass ejection occurred during an eclipse in 1860. And here's, a, here's one that's pretty similar from a, a modern day eclipse. Now, the shape of the coronal will be different. Uh, when, when you're near solar minimum, the uh, corona is extended along the Earth's, the sun's equator. Uh, when you're at near, more near solar max, uh, the corona is uh, more uniform uh, all the way around. So we're going to see something a little more like this uh, than we had at, uh, in 2017. And of course, you know, once it's all over, <laughs> it's time to celebrate. <laughs> and I think uh, just about anybody who's, who's uh, seen their first eclipse, uh, it really is a moving experience. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I like to do, particularly since I work with planetariums, is take fisheye photography. Uh, and uh, this was one in, in China. Uh, I call this one Dra Dragon Eats Sun because <laughs> we saw this cloud and we got in the bus and drove two miles uh, to get out from under it and just, just barely did. But you can kind of see the, the uh, sunset appears all the way around you. Uh, except right underneath the sun, because there's what, that's where the shadow is reaching the surface. <clears throat> Here's one uh, from a cruise ship off of Australia, and cruise ships are wonderful. This one we saw, we saw the green flash from, and it was the best green flash I ever saw was this was uh, off a ship like this. This was the one in Libya that I mentioned that had the the very best. Um, the very best shadow cone coming at you. It also had the best shadow bands uh, where you, right before and right after the, uh, the eclipse, there's a diffraction pattern uh, that, that looks like bands uh, uh, from the edge of, the, of the, the sliver of the sun creating a diffraction pattern on the earth. Uh, but again, since this was so near noon, look how, Look how nearly symmetric that uh, that 360 sunset was. Uh, this was one that was pretty iffy. Uh, the clouds were kind of coming and going, but uh, we still had a pretty good view in uh, 
in Australia. And if you look real closely, you could pick out Venus <laughs> through one of the gaps <laughs> in the uh, in the in the clouds. Uh, this one was nice because there were natives and they were banging bells and it was wonderful. So how do you observe it safely? Well, you've got to use eye protection clearly, special filters for your binoculars, your telescope and your cameras. Um, only during totality is it safe uh, to use your naked eye. And you can use projection uh, techniques. And everybody talks about pinhole cameras, but they kind of suck. <laughs> so, uh, my favorite thing to do is, of course, to, to get some uh, solar filters and put it on front of your camera or put it on front of your binoculars. Uh, you can also take a pair of eclipse glasses and cut them up and put them on the front of your camera or put them on the front of your binoculars. Uh, this was, again, uh, from Australia, a uh, cruise ship. Um, he mentioned I bought 35, I gave away 35,000 glasses in 2017. I purchased 25,000 and NASA gave me 10 to give away. I've now ordered another 25,000. Uh, they're not here yet, but uh, I'm, as I'm going to be doing teacher training, so I'm going to make sure every teacher that gets the training gets a classroom set. And we're giving them in envelopes so that they hopefully <laughs> Don't ruin them between now and 2023. Uh, pinhole projection, you know, as I said, it, you can punch a hole in a box and look at, at the image, but it's pretty small. Um, but one way that we made to, uh, to make the image a little better was to, um, to take a pair of readers made the hole a little bit bigger and used the readers to bring it into focus. So you got a little bit brighter and a little bit crisper image and it, you know, you can buy a pair of readers for a buck at the, at the dollar store. <laughs> so that's one way to do a pinhole for jam. Another fun way is with a, uh, a straw hat or a colander. Um, one of the most fun things if you've got a group is to, uh, to, uh, um, is to punch holes in a piece of cardboard and then take a picture of its shadow. So each one of the holes in the, in the cardboard turns into a little, uh, a little eclipse. So this is from Australia. So you see Alpha and Beta Centauri and the, and the Southern, Southern Cross, <laughs> but it really makes a nice, a nice souvenir is that, that um, shadow of, a, of an image and you can put your location or your name or what your school or whatever, and that makes a lot of fun. So eclipse glasses are, are great, but there's certainly no magnification. So the sun is, you know, half a degree apart, but you can, you can still see stuff. Um, Whereas, you know, my favorite thing to do is to get some of these pop off uh, solar filters. Uh, I get them from, uh, from uh, um, Rainbow Symphony. Uh, they've gone up in price. They were like $15 per lens, and now they're more like $25 lens. But what's cool is they pop on and off really easily. And so you're, you're, you know, watching uh, through the binoculars th through the partial phases, and then you pop them off for, for totality. Now, the most critical piece uh, to, to get is this little binocular adapter that screws into the, the center hinge of a good pair of binoculars and screws into a photographic type tripod on the other end. And with that, you can mount binoculars. And so if you've got a big crowd of people, you have a filtered pair of binoculars and they can come by and, and you don't have to keep finding the sun because once the filters are on the binoculars, it's actually not hard, not easy to find the sun. <laughs> so you put it on a tripod and then you let the kids come up and look through the binoculars and it's safe and, and, and they don't have to have to hunt for it. Now, the, my trick to find the sun 
when I do have a pair of binoculars with filters uh, is to just kind of lean back and, and until I get my face pointing right toward the sun, not looking out of the corner, but you know, you can kind of tell with, even with your eyes closed when you're looking at the sun and then you bring the binoculars up with the filters on and then open your eyes. And usually uh, the, um, the um, uh, sun will be in your field of view. You always zoom, zoom out first. And then once you find the sun, zoom in. Uh, but as you can imagine, if the sun's straight, nearly straight overhead, which is what it is, uh, going to be for this one. I mean, that's that's a that's a neck breaker. <laughs> so, uh, one of the coolest uh, telescopes I've saw for for looking at uh, at partial eclipses was uh, was like a Newtonian, but instead of having a single eyepiece, it actually had a binocular eyepiece. So you looked in horizontally, but it was looking up. And it was very, very comfortable. So uh, I recommend that as a, as, a great, uh, as a great option if you've got a binocular eyepiece for your telescope. Um, these are my comet catchers, which have been with me around the world. I got them for Halley's Comet and they, they have a really nice big field of view, which is good. Uh, and I, I use them both either to look directly or also for projection. Uh, but you do have to be really careful and really remind people that you have to have the filters on the objective end and not on the eyepiece. This is a guy who put his put his filter, put his solar filters on glasses on, and then he put a pair of binoculars on top of it. And you know, that's not good for the old eyeballs. But you can, in fact, cut these apart and tape them over a pair of binoculars. I have done that. You have to make sure you do good black tape until all the cardboard is covered with black tape uh, and you do it on the front side, then you can use it. But it makes your thing sticky. So, I mean, I'd rather spend a little, little extra money and get the ones that pop in and pop off. And I saw another guy doing one like that and he used a beer cozy <laughs> and he had a solar filter in the end of a beer cozy. So he put that over his telephoto camera. Uh, and then when it went total, he just popped off the beer cozy. So that makes it having to unscrew a glass solar filter is a royal pain. Um, so these, these are the ones that I normally get are from, uh, Rainbow Symphony and then the binocular adapter, you can get it from, from Lancy and Sky or Amazon or almost any place. Uh, another thing I like to do if I have big crowds is, is binocular projection. I cover up one lens and let the other lens of my binoculars create an image. Uh, preferably it's nice if you can do it right at the edge of a shadow so that you can put this image in the shadow. You get a really nice clear image and you can use the focusing ring on your binoculars to get a really nice uh, in focus image, but make sure nobody sticks their head up underneath it because that could be very uh, dangerous. Uh, sometimes what I'll do, you want to do it low to the ground so they can't get up under that and uh, and you, you want to see the image in the shadows. So, um, so I'll often put a piece of, of fabric around the rest of the binoculars so it gives you a shadow uh, so you can then get the solar image like that. Um, but the really critical thing is that every person should have their own binoculars for totality. And they don't have to be expensive. They can be opera glasses, 10 by 20s, but Everybody needs to have their own binoculars. Totality is incredibly short. The partial phases are really long and boring. <laughs> but totality is really short. So I always make sure everybody in my class group has their binoculars on a string around their neck, ready to go, no filters. We share the filtered binoculars so everybody can kind of watch it all happening. But then when we go into totality, everybody's got their own because 
you want to enjoy it, especially if this is your first time. And everybody likes to take pictures, but don't spend your entire uh, time behind a, an eyepiece. You know, get enjoy it with your eyes and a pair of binoculars. Because that's the best way to, to to really get the the whole effect. And also just look around, find a cool place to stand that you know the that the sun is going to be behind a, a tree or something. I got uh, when I was in Wyoming, I got the the eclipse sun next to a uh, an old fashioned windmill, you know, and so it really made a, an interesting photo. It's, you know, not just a, a sun in a blank uh, sky. Now, another really good one to use for observing the sun is called a sun spotter. It makes a really nice, big, crisp image. Um, they're not cheap and they're a little cumbersome to carry around, but you know, if you're if you're driving there, it's not a problem, and a lot of people can can look at it safely without having to worry about you know accidentally hurting themselves. And and it you can even set them up even if the if the sun is almost directly overhead, you can still get a good view. So I I recommend them even though they're kind of pricey. <clears throat> Uh, we often like to take a, an H alpha telescope along this a small one or a big one, and uh, uh, so that uh, uh, you can kind of get a feeling for what the prominences are going to look like before it goes total, because uh, that gives you a clue as to how, you know, where the where the uh, where it'll look like. Uh, this is an, a training I did showing various ways of. Of, of observing the sun with the Sorry, girls. I couldn't hear what you said. Siri just thought I was talking to her. <laughs> now, if you've got a group, what do you do? Well, you know, you punch the board for those pinhole pictures. You have somebody measuring temperatures, somebody on the sun spotter, somebody with a camcorder. Uh, a reading chart is nice. You know, what's the smallest font you can read? As, this, as the light level goes to gone. Uh, looking under trees, the little trees uh, will create little tiny uh, crisp eclipse crescents under the trees. Um, as I mentioned, straw hats. Uh, the other thing is, is to really watch what, uh, what the animals are doing. Um, and then, of course, you can also watch the video from other locations coming in before or after. What if it's cloudy? Well, you can still measure the temperature and the wind changes. You can still do the reading chart. You can start watching animal behavior. And one of the really cool things is to see the birds start to roost, the, the dogs start to lie down. Everything gets really quiet. Uh, the frogs might start chirping. So those kind of animal behaviors you can look out for, even if it's cloudy, okay? Uh, <clears throat> one of the most interesting animal behaviors that I ever saw was uh, in a cruise in the Caribbean in 98. And uh, just as totality was approaching, all the birds started their, you know, settling down behavior, but like three dolphins came to the surface and they went, what the heck is going on? <laughs> I, can, I can just believe that they had no clue what's going on, but they, they knew it was weird. They knew it was not supposed to look like that. <laughs> but I had never seen a dolphin uh, look at a solar eclipse. All right, well, there are some cool science you can do in eclipses. Uh, this one was really neat. They, they took some, uh, some images of the sun in, in different wavelengths of light. Uh, the green was uh, three and a half million uh, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, which is crazy, but, uh, and the red was one and a half million. And you see that those field lines that I mentioned near the poles of the sun, uh, the corona is much cooler. Uh, so it's measurably cooler than it is where the magnetic field lines are closed. And so that heat gets bottled up, basically. Uh, there was another really cool uh, quasi-citizen science one that they took GPS uh, measurements of the ionosphere. And you can actually watch the shadow going across the ionosphere. 
uh, at this meeting uh, and uh, with this movie. It's really, it's really sharp. And, I, and they, there are a lot of ham radio operators that are doing experiments during uh, eclipses. And there was a beautiful shot of, a, of a, a stratospheric balloon that was taking images during the eclipse. So uh, bottom line, when's the next one? Uh, well, you, you generally get one or two solar eclipses every year, but they might just be partial, two or three lunar eclipses each year. And you, you have to have at least a partial at least two weeks before or two weeks after a total solar eclipse. There has to be at least a partial lunar eclipse. Um, but the next ones in Texas after these two is only a partial and it's not till 2045. So um, some of us may not be around for that. <laughs> here, are the, here are the totals that we will be having uh, through uh, North America for the next, you know, 30 years. And here are the annulars. So this was that annular in 2012. Uh, and of course, that was the 2017 one that, that a lot of us went to. So, you know, don't, uh, don't, and this is the one for 2045. So it's, it's going to go through uh, Oklahoma and, and Colorado. So that will be, that will be a good one for the young folks that are are still around. Well, uh, photography is hard to get a perfect shot. Bracket, bracket, bracket. Take short exposures to get the inner uh, corona and the prominences. Take long exposures to get the outer one. Be sure you turn off the flash. If you flash a flash photography during a total totality, I guarantee you're going to get shredded by the people next to you. <laughs> we, we did practices and we went around with black tape and stuck black tape over their idiot cameras. <laughs> um, videography is nice. And one of the cool things about videography is you can take off your filter early if you're doing a video. I, I've never killed a video camera from that, from doing that. Uh, so you can really start to get the, uh, the, 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 in fact, this, this image that I'm showing here is kind of like that. You get, you can start to get the Corona even as the diamond ring is still up. The other interesting thing about a video camera is you can get the sound and the responses. Everybody's responses are a lot of fun. It's great to hear everybody's oohs and ahs. Uh, but it does tell me that I have to be careful and get away from, uh, so I don't get it all on the recording. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, I mean, some of these pictures are just amazing. So he uses these multiple exposures and then puts them together to get this really fine detail. And several people are really good at it, but this guy is one of the best. And here's one that, that you went to see, the outer one. And you can even see the moon's features. This is from the Earth shine on the moon. You can see the moon's features. So this is real. This is not just noise. That's actual lunar features uh, from these multiple exposures. All right, well, first timers, just enjoy it. Don't spend your totality behind the lens. Always put the filters closer to the sun. Watch out for viewfinders. Put them in sunset mode, I find works the best with an idiot's camera. And uh, also, once it gets to be 95%, I make, make sure everybody in my crowd is sitting down. Nobody moves once it's 95%, because once it gets dark, it gets dark in a hurry, and you don't want to trip over anybody. All right, well, there's a lot of good uh, sources of information. There's a wonderful NASA site. Here's my Eclipse newsletter list that you can sign up for on my Eclipse website. And then of course there's texaseclipse.net and good place to get filters if you all know that. So, um, and you know that, <laughs> all right. So anyway, this is, this is kind of what I use to, to, to tell teachers what to do. And so if you've got any suggestions, let me know. I am gonna be speaking tomorrow night for the Observe the Moon at Rice, 
uh, I was going to do the Observe the Moon at Rice tonight, but since I got invited to talk to you all, I'm going to do Observe the Moon uh, tomorrow at Rice. So if anybody doesn't want to go out to George, uh, you can come come to Rice and uh, and listen, but the talk's going to be pretty similar, so you probably don't want to hear the talk. <laughs> so the talk's at six, and then the observatory will be open uh, till 10. So that's what I got, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great presentation, Dr. Reif. Thank you so much for um, a wonderful talk. I, I had to put myself on mute because I was chuckling along with you <laughs> and it brought back memories of uh you know some of the things i experienced in the 2017 eclipse as well um, but we did have a couple questions in the chat um chris menon chris do you want to come off of mute and ask your question yeah which is the i live in houston which is the best place to go out of houston to see totality uh, well as i said i would get out of houston <laughs> Where? You can Where? you can go up to Waco. You can go to Fredericksburg. You can go to Northwest Austin, Northwest San Antonio, uh, Dallas. Uh, okay. You know, all of Dallas. And but it kind of goes the zone of totality. Kind of most uh, most of uh, Fort Worth is not in totality, but most of Dallas is. Okay. Uh, so. But main thing, get out of Houston. Don't, don't please, please leave Houston. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because it, it, it really, you want to kind of keep an eye on the cloud cover and, and the forecast, because that's okay. really the most important thing is to try to get away from the clouds if you can. Thank you. And uh, just my bit of advice here when 2017 came around, that was my first time uh, attending uh, anything like that, uh, the eclipse then. Uh, some of the decision making, uh, or, you know, the, the, the inputs that went into determining where people went was uh, access, right? Roads, if, if things did start to get cloudy, um, you know, how easy would it be to get somewhere else along that path of totality? So uh, that's something else to consider as well. Okay, uh, Bart Moore had a question as well. Bart, do you want to come off of mute and ask? <clears throat> Hi there. Yeah, you mentioned something about when the, when the sun is partially obscured. Of course, the, the sort of cone of light uh, becomes narrower. Um, you've got more of a sliver. And mm -hmm. I, I thought that you mentioned something about some kind of rainbow artist, but I'm not quite sure about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's two things that we'll do. One is to make a rainbow. No. Okay. And that's that's called a corona rainbow, actually. <laughs> uh, so it makes a corona rainbow around the sun, which is easiest to see if there's a cloud nearby. Uh, but then the other thing that really narrow slit of sunlight does is create a diffraction pattern on the ground. And that diffraction pattern is moving at a thousand miles an hour with that with that shadow is moving a thousand miles an hour. So it look like ripples. Uh, uh, if you put out a white sheet on the on the ground, you'll see these ripples uh, from the uh, they're called shadow bands. And I have a video that we made in Libya, and it's I mean it's not it's hard to see, but I think some people got some better uh, shadow band videos from 2017. We we got one uh, a pretty good one on a sheet on a chair. Well, I'd like to show you a picture I took during 2017. David, if I could uh, share my screen. Um, I think oh, I can go ahead and take it. All right, so let's see here. All right, so hopefully you can see this image now. Oh. Um, this, I, I used a reflecting lens on my digital SLR camera, and I was just I was surprised to see this. Okay, and I, when you mentioned the the, uh, the rainbow effects, this came to my mind. Is this an example of a kind of artifact we might expect to see? Yeah, that that's an internal reflection that's causing a, uh, a rainbow in your camera. That's that's in your camera. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Okay. But but that said, one of my one of my friends did a, put a diffraction grating in front of her camera as the as the sun got to be a really neat sliver and she got a really cool set of 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 images of the sun in the in in the rainbow just from the from the spectrum of the sun that was really cool but no that's an internal reflection in your camera and you're going to get that a lot 
because you've got a really bright sun bouncing around in your, in your camera. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Okay. But it's neat. Yeah. All right, uh, I think Aaron uh, had a couple of comments he wanted to make. Aaron, do you wanna make yes. those comments? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, awesome, Pat, thank you again. I always love listening to your presentations and this one uh, was wonderful again, so thank you. Uh, but I had two comments. One of them was uh, something you mentioned on one of your last slides, which was there's lots of things you can see and you don't wanna be stuck behind your camera the whole time because you'll miss a lot of them. And I had that problem in 2017. We went up to Wyoming to see it and I had a list of 30 things I wanted to see, complete with a timeline. I mean, I knew exactly when all of them were gonna happen. And a lot of my friends, including uh, Dr. Reif here, said, no, your first eclipse, because this was my first total, you need to just sit back and enjoy it. And their excuse was, because you may never see another one. And my thinking was, no, I got to do all 30 of these things, because I may never see another one. <laughs> so it, it was tough. <laughs> Uh, so that one, I did all 30 things. This one coming up in 2024, I'm just going to go chill and then really enjoy it. So I, I think that is really good advice. I mean, I don't think I missed anything, but I think it would have been more enjoyable to watch the whole thing. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, shortly before that eclipse uh, at Best Buy, this is not an ad for Best Buy, but at Best Buy, they were selling eclipse binoculars. And so I actually bought a pair of these binoculars and, you know, they're fully internally filtered. So you can't, you know, expose yourself. And what I found when I was watching the eclipse in 2017 was, you know, leading up to totality, I would use the uh, solar binoculars. And when we hit totality, I would flip over and use my regular binoculars. Then of course, flip back. It was great. So that's an option. And they weren't very expensive. You know, they're like 40, 50 bucks or something from Celestron. So pretty cool. And that was it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely there's one one that's really cool it's like five bucks and it's only a two times magnification but it's it's a little binoculars that pop that folds flat and pops up and it's you can stick it in your pocket <laughs> it's real cute yeah okay. I, I have a whole box full of stuff i also have some eclipse shades that fill your whole face and that's nice too because you do have to worry a little bit about kids uh, looking around their their glasses and of course welder's glass number 14 also works um but then you have to take it off <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and and since you mentioned that i do need to say one more thing uh if you do not do it with one piece of welder's glass it could be one over each eye but if you don't do it with just one thickness of welder's glass you can't just add the numbers it's not linear so two sevens do not equal 14, just a warning. The other thing somebody told me, and again, I, I'm not, I, I've never done this, but he wears a pair of Eclipse goggles for basically the entire uh, partial going in. And he said his eyes get so well dark adapted that when it goes total, he sees so much more. So I don't know. Something we could try, yeah. <laughs> it's actually worth a try. Uh, yeah, right. he, he said he really needs, you need a half an hour for your eyes to really, your visual purple to pop up. Oh. We did have a request from uh, Martiel Luther. She doesn't have a microphone right now, but she asked if you could share your links again to sign up for the newsletter. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, listen, if you just, well, here, I'll, I'll share, share my, my website. How's that? The, there's, there's, uh, is it the bit.ly slash rice eclipse? Yeah, or, or if you want to just start at texaseclipse.net. So if you start at texaseclipse.net, uh, you can get to everywhere from that. So, oops, where did you go here? Didn't mean to lose you here. Or yeah, so texaseclipse.net, uh, this shows all the universities in Texas that are near, uh, uh, near the eclipse, it's got, uh, uh, and you can zoom in on it, it's a Google map. So it's got ballparks, it's got state parks so <laughs> in the zones. The universities we included ones that were not 
fully in the totality, but here's here's a listing of all the, these are the education service centers and, and they're of course not all in, but for all of these that are in totality, we say how, how much of totality they have. Um, so there, all that information is here. And if you see something we should add, let me know. Uh, but then you can go back from this to the Rice Eclipse site or to sign up for Eclipse Net newsletter. So my three links are all, all on this one page, okay? So this is the Rice Eclipse site. And it also gives you a place to sign up for the Eclipse newsletter. And, and it has, you know, information of, of, uh, of, of, of the upcoming eclipses. It's got the, uh, the eclipse graphics that I was showing you, the diagrams, and then all of these eclipse animations, both in fisheye and in flat screen. So these are the YouTube versions, but if you want, uh, if you need the fisheye versions, uh, uh, let me know. We also have animations for Artemis. We've just released these. So there's a really neat flyby of Artemis that's going to be happening in November. And so we created a, an animation of that and also an animation of the Artemis path, uh, the figure eight path as, as, as it's going uh, from the earth uh, to the moon and back. So all of these things are on my space.rice.edu gets you to everything <laughs> <laughs> and uh and all sorts of our other other materials so we I, I have classes for teachers i have pictures from our old my old eclipse uh trips and uh, so there's a lot of stuff on here but uh yeah the the, the first place to go though is is the texas.rice um texas eclipse.net That'll take us to everything we need from there. Thank that you. That will take you where you need to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We had one last question in the chat. Uh, Chris Jones. Chris, do you want to come off of mute and ask your question? I hope it's working. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, if you're using uh, a camera set up for infrared photography, does that do anything? Do you see anything different uh, at totality than you would? Does it pick up any stray light or anything like that? Huh. I don't know. I've never, I've never thought about that. It would be fun to try. I don't right. know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> but it's, it sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, they, this, I mean, the Corona is, is hot, but it's very tenuous. So it, the Corona really doesn't put out a lot of infrared light because it's millions of degrees, not, not, um, uh, not not hundreds of degrees. You put out a lot of infrared. <laughs> <laughs> you and I. Okay. Um, did you do you have time for maybe one or two more questions? We we're out of you know the questions from the chat. I just wanted to see if uh, it's okay if we opened it up and uh, if anybody wanted to ask a question before we wrap up here tonight, they can take themselves off of mute and uh, ask ask directly. Um. I don't know if this is working. We can okay, yeah, I think it's working. Now. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I did write it in the chat, but I think it might have been answered earlier. Uh, are the powerpoints and the, you know, the powerpoints of today's, you know, talk is that on the Rice website as well? The PowerPoint that's on there now is from the 2017. I'm actually going to put this version up on it. Uh, the problem is, of course, it's got a lot of movies in it, so it's really big. So um, I'll. It, it, I'll, it, I'll probably have to put a link to a Dropbox or something so that because it's by the time you download all the movies, it's kind of weird. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I will. I will definitely. I am definitely going to do that. So, but let me know if you see anything I should add or subtract. If you think it's, you know, I, I want to make it, you know, as general as possible. I know you, as I mentioned, you guys are the experts, so it's a little pedestrian for for some of you guys, but, <laughs> but they're all fun. And you know, my husband says, oh man, you're going to another eclipse. Haven't you seen one or seen them all? Are you kidding? <laughs> but you know, but they reach his own. Right. <laughs> all right. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, Joe, go ahead. 
Um, what do you think about the idea of asking the schools to just not have school on that day and let kids watch it from home? Because I'm a little worried the school will just be unwilling to take on the legal liability and will just like keep all the kids safely inside through the school day. Well, right. that right. happened in 2017. Mm -hmm. There were teachers that were told by their principals they were not allowed to let their kids yeah. outside. Yeah because of liability. It was the stupidest thing I ever heard of. Yeah, but I've yes. heard of that before. Yeah, my, my sister uh, lives across the street from an elementary school in the suburb of Dallas. Uh, and uh, she's been trying to talk to school and declaring that a, a day off so the kids can watch from home. Yeah, uh, or, or go with their families to someplace. But the nice thing about using it as a field trip day, I mean, if you could really then get the buses together and, and really met, go to a safe location. Well, that, that school has a huge lot and uh, it's in the path of totality. Oh, perfect. well, I remember that when we had the annular come through in 94, my kids were at Westview Elementary and I brought out all the stuff uh, at the, at the, um, um, in their parking lot. And I had a TV screen. So people who were nervous could see it on the TV screen. And I had binoculars and things like that. I remember one time we were flying, we were flying, uh, and, and there was, there was, a a, 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 a partial solar eclipse in an airplane. And, uh, I, I had some filtered binoculars and I handed it to the stewardess and I said, look at this. This is, this is incredible. And she goes, oh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to look at it. My nerve was <laughs> I'm a professional. I know this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, some, I, one time I was on a flight and there was a spectacular display of sprites going on outside and I could not interest anybody around me into looking at it. Are you like saying we have a problem with science education in this country? Is that what you're alluding to? When I was in on a cruise ship in Australia in 2012, the cruise ship had several eclipse groups on it. And, um, but there were also a ton of people on the cruise ship that had no idea there was an eclipse. And some of them did not get out of bed. They could have been, if they were on the port side of the boat, they could have watched it in their jammies from their, from their balcony. <laughs> but yeah, no, the next, that, that after, you know, when we all went down for breakfast afterwards, it's, oh no, we slept through it. Anyway. <laughs> well, one, one by one, I've dragged, I've dragged my siblings to go see total eclipses and they're always just like, oh, well, I've seen an, you know, an 80% eclipse and blah, blah, blah. And then, and then afterwards, they always go like, oh, now I understand. Now I get it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have one sibling left who still is like, no, I don't need to travel for that. I've seen eclipses. What's the difference? <laughs> so after COVID is done, we've got to work as hard as we can on outreach. I think that uh, we got work to do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, David. I was going to say, say yeah. Bill, I, I follow up your, your, your thing about science education because I remember Paul Maley supplied us a, a slide for the 2017 where a parent wrote the school and asked if the event could be postponed today because it wasn't convenient. <laughs> there you go. But, you go. but Beautiful. I, a comment I will make, I do agree, as Joe, Joe just mentioned about outreach, all of us have a duty to get out, to get the information out of what is and what is accept, acceptable to use and what is not acceptable to use. Yeah. I was with, Connie and I were with Paul Maley in, in Nebraska doing it up there. I came back to work at Methodist with otherwise educated physicians who were telling their postdocs, oh sure, just use a piece of exposed and developed x-ray film and you could use that. And I went, sweet Jesus, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> offering that kind of advice. I said, no, don't do it. I'm going to have to do it again as 2023 starts coming around. So all of us also have to do the outreach thing of what is, is and is not acceptable for observing eclipses. Yeah, and I think that uh, just because someone is like, you know, educated in one area of science doesn't mean they know like a whole lot about the other areas. And I think that's also important for people to realize as well. <laughs> 
I, I see a comment says the Missouri State Patrol traffic sign said, don't drive with your solar glasses on. I like that. <laughs> oh, so, so, this, so this 2012 Australian cruise that so many people didn't know was an eclipse. They had interviewed a bunch of us about, about the eclipse and what to expect and how to observe it safely and everything like that. So, <clears throat> so we did. And, and the guy says, you know, what's the big deal about eclipses? And I said, well, you know, you, you plan for this, you, you save up, you, you get all your equipment, you get everything ready, you know, you you get this heightened anticipation. You're not, you're not sure it's going to turn out. You're not sure that everything's going to work. And, you know, and then it's over in three minutes. I said, it's, it's like an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and <coughs> the, I realized they were taping me, but what I didn't realize is they were going to play that on the TV screen on the boat about every hour for three days. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it maybe it convinced somebody to see it they wouldn't otherwise otherwise all right well david do you, would you like to uh, uh do there. us the honors here yeah i think we're concluded with that i think uh please everybody if you unmute and we'll give uh let's we'll give dr reef a, a big round of applause and thanks for a great great talk uh, uh. <laughs> It was great. And with that, again, I thank Joe for hosting us. And please save the date for next year for 2022. All clubs, hopefully be Friday, October 28th. And hopefully we'll run some kind of an A-Day on Saturday, October 29th. Slated to be a first quarter moon at about 30 35%. And thank you. Thanks, everyone, one and all, for coming out. Thank you Appreciate all. It. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for a wonderful talk. Thank you, everybody, for joining Thank us. You. And uh, the meeting is officially adjourned. Everyone be safe and have a great evening and uh, enjoy International Observe the Moon Night tomorrow. Good night. Thank you for having us.